uh, tonight. I thought I would <clears throat> do it a little differently. This is more like what I would normally do a Sunday school lesson. <clears throat> and a while back, a lot of our Thursday nights were this way as, uh, as well because it was more of a ministry training uh, idea. If you need a pen, who needs a pen? Anyone? <clears throat> There's a box of pens somewhere up there that they can get for you, somebody can get for you. <clears throat> and so, like I said, <clears throat> we, we're going to be working at memorizing Isaiah 53 in the month of November, but then we decided to push that forward and, and go through December as well because nobody had really uh, worked at it, which is fine. I understand how that goes. <clears throat> And so I kind of committed myself to it a little bit more uh, this week. I still probably only got first four verses <laughs> or so really well. Uh, and the thing is about Bible memorization is you got to really work at it. And probably should uh, maybe one day preach a message uh, about Bible memory and maybe some little tips uh, that can that can help on that because I know it's something I need to work on. That's the thing about preaching, though. You kind of have to apply something to your own life before you can preach to other people and tell them to do it. And so sometimes I hold off on messages until I am ready to attack it in my own life. Uh, but I did think uh, it would be appropriate to go through this first, I mean, this chapter verse by verse and break it down, which will probably help you memorize it if you can get this uh, down in your mind as we break this down into uh, sections. Uh, but first, let's go ahead and go to that chapter, Isaiah 53, and uh, has anybody worked on memorizing it or think you could do a few verses? Everybody's like, no, not in front of everybody. Okay, let's stand and just do it together then. <clears throat> and we'll just read this, uh, read it all the way through, and then we'll break it down. Um, and basically, I'm just going to go through this handout, fill in the blanks, and uh, that will, you know, hopefully, hopefully it's not too long of a uh, of a message. But I'm going to break this down, and I think it'll help under, help you understand this chapter. Let's read it, uh, Isaiah 53. Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, he shall he open not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people he was stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath uh, put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death, 
and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Lord, thank you for this chapter, and thank you for your word and the prophecies concerning Jesus. Uh, we already have faith in him, Lord, but just as the more we learn and grow uh, in knowledge of your word, the more our faith grows. It's so amazing uh, how the Bible works. And Lord, I pray that you just bless it tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so you see right away in the title of this, uh, you know, anything that I had written or shared online or whatever about what I was preaching tonight just said Isaiah 53. But I think a good title for the sermon would be, or the lesson, however you want to look at it, is the gospel according to Isaiah. I mean, if you just read this and didn't already know your Bible a little bit and maybe know where the you know where this verse was, you would think it was in the New Testament. In fact, it's interesting as he reads it, he's like, he was wounded for our transgression, past tense. Well, Jesus hadn't come for many, many years. I mean, he didn't come, uh, you know, for many, many years after this was written. But most of the writing in there talks about it like in the past or or maybe in the present. Uh, there are some, you know, in instances where he talks about the future, but it seems like that has more to do with, you know, the coming kingdom that's not here yet. So it's almost as if it was written in our day. And uh, it's so amazing how, how it's written. Of course, that just shows that God is, uh, you know, not limited by time and that all the things, you know, that are, are going to happen, it's as if they already happen and from his perspective because he already knows uh, what's going to happen. And so uh, this is a really interesting chapter. And the Old Testament, of course, is full of verses that I just don't understand how a... A Jewish person, uh, you know, that's raised Jewish, wouldn't open their Bible and read these and be like, "Whoa," <laughs> you know. And I have heard testimonies of of people who, you know, read this and for the first time had heard the gospel story and said, "Whoa, maybe I ought to read about Jesus because this seems to match him uh, him very well." And so I remember sitting down one time when I was, uh, see, was well, when I worked at Burlington Coat Factory in Lenexa, Kansas, many years ago. Uh, sitting down with a gentleman, older gentleman who was Jewish, and talked to him about this passage and said, what do you think about that? And so he didn't really have a great answer, but he was very adamant that Jesus you know, was an imposter and, and it wasn't real and all that stuff. But man, if you read this, there's no doubt about it. It is the gospel story. And it was almost, again, like it was. it, it could have just been Added in there. You got Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and you could have just slipped Isaiah in there. Nobody would have known if it was Isaiah 53 in there uh, because it tells that story. So throughout the four Gospels, we see many Old Testament scriptures quoted uh, as being fulfilled prophecy. Okay, This was done to fulfill what you know so-and-so had said. A lot of times it's Isaiah, or Isaiah. And uh, also the a lot of Psalms are also... Uh, uh, quoted in the New Testament. So that's your blanks right there. They're found in the Psalms and in the book of Isaiah. A lot of other verses as well. My, uh, Malachi and all kinds of places are referenced. But as you read the New Testament, you see that these things happen and they fulfilled Old Testament prophecy. Now, it's kind of confusing. Again, the whole idea about God not existing in, in time it's confusing. It boggles the mind, and that's why people get caught up on Calvinism and stuff like that because they don't understand that. And I'm not saying I have it all figured out or I can process in my mind how God can be eternal and and you know not be not uh, be limited by time and all that stuff. But in my mind, I have to remind myself sometimes that it's not like the things that happen in the New Testament, the Gospel was like oh like a checklist, like I got, I got, I forgot, Isaiah said this, I need to make sure I do this, right? I forgot I need to tie up a colt over here. I forgot I need to, you know, get, uh, I need to turn over these tables in the temple, you know, because my zeal hath eaten him up and I got to fulfill that. That's not what's going on in the New Testament. It's just saying, hey, these things happen. Oh yeah, remember by the Old Testament, we said this was going to happen. And so uh, this is uh, co consistent all through the Bible where we see references back to the Old Testament and it, it explains that this is a fulfillment. But in this particular chapter, Isaiah 53, uh, again, it's so clear. And the way that it's written, uh, I can't help but think of it as a go another gospel account. Okay, the gospel according to Isaiah. And what's interesting about this passage 
is that you know, this is what I'm going to show you primarily here uh, tonight is that it's it, it, it uh, specifically talks about how Christ's own people weren't even going to receive him whenever he came. And that's exactly what happened. And again, like I said, if you were Jewish and you read that and you're like, oh, you know how we're rejecting Jesus? Like that's exact, or you know, reje rejecting him as the Messiah. That's exactly what Isaiah said we were going to do. <laughs> but it didn't dawn on them. They didn't, they weren't following that through, I guess. Uh, and, and actually, I'll tell you why here in a minute. Okay, so he compares, uh, uh, he, he, look at uh, uh, verse 1 here. He talks about that. And he's going to give us the reasons why the people didn't, didn't uh, receive him. Okay, Isaiah 53 verse 1 says, Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? Now go to John chapter 12. You know, mark your place because we're going to be in Isaiah 53 a lot. Okay, and go over to John chapter 12. And we'll see this verse is quoted in John 12. Starting in verse 37, it says, But though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him. Now it's going to explain why. It says that the saying of Isaiah, the prophet, might be fulfilled. Again, it's not like, okay, so God made them where they couldn't believe that so that it fulfilled this prophecy. It's just like, this is what happened. And it's like, oh, by the way, this is what Isaiah said was going to happen. Okay, and he said, uh, when he spake, the Lord... Who hath believed our report, and to whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore they could not believe, because that Isaiah said again, and again, it's not really saying, like, they couldn't believe it because Isaiah said, that's not the implication. The implication is, you know, just like Isaiah said, uh, He hath blinded their eyes, and hardened their heart, that they should not see with their eyes, nor understand with their heart and be converted and I should heal them. And that gets into the whole idea of people who harden their heart, you know, kind of like Pharaoh hardened his heart. And then God turns them over to a reprobate mind like Romans 1 talks about. And he hardens their heart and makes it to where they're not going to see what seems so clear and so obvious and so simple to accept. For instance, Isaiah 53, doesn't that point out Jesus? No, 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 that, that can't be Jesus. That's got to be somebody else. Why don't they believe that? Because they've hardened their hearts and they've rejected it and God's turned them over to a reprobate mind. And they're blind. They can't even see it. Now, some people are just believing a lie or whatever, and maybe there's still hope for them, but there are some who are just blinded to it and they'll never get it because uh, they've already hardened their heart to it. And so uh, that's what that part's talking about. But of course, this is, uh, again, uh, what we read uh, in the Bible saying that, you know, whenever he comes, the people aren't going to receive him. So John 1, you remember it talked about that, uh, says that his own received him not. John chapter 1, starting in verse 10. He was in the world. And this is all talking about the word of God, right? If you read the context here. He was in the world and the world was made by him. And the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. And so the Bible is telling you right there that, you know, Jesus came into the world, and many didn't receive him. They, even his own people didn't receive them. We read further in the gospel accounts, uh, look at Matthew 13. Uh, I'm just picked per particular verses out of these chapters, but Ma Matthew, Mark, Luke, they all uh, they all talk about these things. But the people that grew up with Jesus, you know, his neighbors, for instance, people who knew Joseph and they knew Mary, uh, they later on, when Jesus was was coming, uh, you know, making his public ministry known, and and he was going around doing these miracles and everything. These are some of the people that didn't believe in him. You know, they they grew up with him and they're like, he's the son of Mary and Joseph and and uh, and, and he can't be. Well, we know this guy. He can't be the Messiah. OK, so there were there were people that grew up with him who didn't ever believe in him. Matthew 13, 53. Sorry, I forgot to turn. Matthew 13, verse 53 says... 
And it came to pass that when Jesus had finished the, these parables, he departed thence. And when he was come into his own country, he taught them in their synagogue, insomuch that they were astonished and said, Whence hath this man this wisdom and these mighty works? Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brethren James and Joses and Simon and Judas? I don't know how the Catholic Church can believe in the perpetual virginity of Mary when the Bible makes it very clear that he had, uh, he had these brothers and sisters. And his sisters, are they not all with us? Whence then hath this man all these things? And they were offended in him. But Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, save in his own country and in his own house. And he did not many, work, many mighty works there because of their unbelief. It's interesting, a lot of times, Jesus, you know, he wasn't interested in proving who he was. It wasn't necessary. Uh, you know, but what he would do a lot of times is he would prove himself through miracles to people who already had faith in him. They already believed in him and it just kind of strengthened their faith. But a lot of times when people don't believe in him, you know, what does he have? He doesn't, he's not worried about it. He sees the heart. He doesn't have to impress anybody like, like we might think that we need to do. Uh, you know, he, he's so many times if they didn't have faith eh, he wasn't concerned about, you know, trying to do mighty works and miracles among them. They didn't have faith. Always reminds me of when Abraham told, uh, Laz, uh, uh, the rich man, you know, Lazarus and the rich man and, and Abraham's bosom. And Abraham says, you know, uh, uh, if one came back from the dead, you know, they wouldn't believe him. They've got, they got Moses and the prophets, you know, but, uh, but if someone comes, he's like, if someone comes back from the dead, you know, my brother will believe. And then they won't, they won't come to this place. And he's like, if one came back from the dead, they wouldn't believe if they don't believe Moses and the prophets. Well, guess what? Jesus came back from the dead. Jesus did all these signs and these miracles. Jesus did all these things. But that only was important to those people who already had faith. And so you read in 1 Corinthians 15, you know, that Jesus showed himself to, you know, the apostles and to his brethren. And, and it seems like he only appeared to people who already had faith in him anyway. And so he's not trying to... Uh, necessarily prove himself to anybody or, or, you know, win anybody's attention. Uh, he's only pleased by our faith. Okay. So his own received or not people who knew him growing up, didn't believe his own brethren, brothers, his own brothers did not believe John chapter seven. John three, verse 5, for neither did his brethren believe in him. Okay, and if you read that context there, it's talking about his literal, his biological or half-brothers, they would be, obviously, but uh, his brothers. Okay, uh, so you got your blank there. Now, Isaiah 53 even explains why these people remain in their unbelief. Okay, this is what we're going to explain in the first few, uh, the first couple verses of that chapter. So go back to Isaiah 53, first couple verses begin to tell us why people, I mean, they're not going to believe in him because of a heart issue. We understand that. But I'm saying these are the, their reasoning, their logic in deciding that they weren't going to believe in Jesus. Okay. So number one, these are all going to start with a, to make it a little easier for you. Okay. Uh, I'll have to stretch the last one a little bit, but they're all going to start with a Isaiah 53. Uh, okay, so it starts out saying, Who hath believed our report, and whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? So the idea there is in the gospel, it's almost like John saying, you know, many he, he came into his own, his own received him not. Okay, so he's starting off saying that the people didn't believe. Who hath believed our report? And whom to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For, right? Notice that word for. That's your that's a blank, by the way. Notice it says for, which means it's important to understand what he just got done saying. So he's saying, hey, a lot of people aren't going to believe for, right? This is the reason that they're not going to believe. He shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of the dry ground. Now, some people have made reference to how the Bible said that he was going to be the root of Jesse and the prophecies, which is, you know, that's applicable for sure. Uh, but it's not like he just picked this word root out of nowhere and said, hey, you know, uh, this will help people understand who we're talking about. That's, that's not the point. Think about what, think about the picture here, a root out of the dry ground. Now, if you have ever worked much with plants, 
uh, you know that when the ground gets dry, maybe just picture a, a pot, a potted plant. Okay, and that soil gets super dry, and uh, uh, you know it's cracks in it and everything. Well, that root is so easy to pluck up at that point. And, uh, and if, if the root hasn't been nourished and it's not you know, like grounded down in there, once that's dry, maybe the plant's even beginning to die. I don't know, but it's, it's just easy. The idea is that it's, it's simple to pull up. So it gives us another picture in case you don't understand that. How about a tender plant? What do you mean a tender plant? Well, again, have you ever, I don't know how many of you worked in a garden, but uh, you know one of the things that we do when we plant a garden uh, is a lot of times you'll plant several seeds in one spot. And then as the seeds grow up, maybe you have three, four plants that actually made it, but you only want to keep the healthiest one. And so you pick the other ones out. Well, you don't wait till they're all grown up and the roots are down and everything is strong to start pulling them up because it's going to be too hard at that point. Right? So you pick them up when they're real small. They're these really tender plants. And I'm telling you, the root is like nothing. And it's so easy. It's like the easiest thing in the world. Just pull that up. It's like it's not even connected to anything, right? Because the, uh, the dirt is, is, uh, is dry and the plant is tender and it just doesn't have that, that, that growth. So what he's saying here is going to would sound offensive to some people. And he's saying literally Jesus is going to be like nothing. He's going to seem like, it's like, where's his strength? Where's his power? Now, obviously, Jesus had a lot of power. And I'm going to read here in these other verses. And again, this offends some people. And I've heard preachers get up and say, you know, don't you think that my Jesus was a wimp? I agree. I'm not going to call Jesus a wimp. He, was all, he had all power, right? But people say, I'm not going to say, and, and, and uh, he's a wimp. And they're going to, and, and I've heard people say about this. He worked in the carpent, carpentry you know, and, and so his muscles were probably big. I think I've probably even preached that myself, okay? Uh, because I want to see him as this muscular man and powerful. And look, he flipped over the tables and he was aggressive and all that stuff. But you got to stretch a little bit to really paint Jesus as this big, muscular, just super strong man. Okay, think about this. He's 30 years old. He goes into the wilderness and he fasts for 40 days and 40 nights. Do you know how do you know how much weight you would lose if you fasted for 40 days and 40 nights? <laughs> and I don't think that this was just a random thing like Jesus never fasted. This was just this one time. I got a feeling he lived off very very small amounts of calories, <laughs> okay? I think he was probably a pretty thin guy. And then all the walking and all the just dedication and the time he spent praying and all that. He ate, okay? The Bible shows us that he ate. He was it's not like he he didn't like food because it was too worldly or something like that. He ate, he sat down and uh, he wasn't afraid to eat and drink. I'm not talking about alcohol, but he ate and drank, but it obviously didn't consume him. He was willing to go 40 days and 40 nights without, without eating. Uh, I just don't see him as this big, massive guy. And if you wanted my proof of that, because there's no real place that it describes what he looked like. Yeah, that's just my logic thinking 40 days without eating. You're probably, you know, not necessarily got a lot of muscles because you don't have the calories, okay? But how about this? He shall grow up before him as a tender plant and a root out of the dry ground. And let's keep reading. He hath no form nor comeliness. And when, what's that mean? That means like he just, he, he wasn't some massive structure to look at. Like, whoa, look at that beautiful, magnificent build, you know? And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. It's not like he was just some, some handsome guy. Like uh, everyone always says, like those paintings. I don't think he's very handsome in those paintings <laughs> where he's got the long hair and the soft features and all. I don't. I wouldn't call that handsome. But, uh, but you know, it's not like people looked at him. I mean, I know he didn't look like those either. But it's not like people looked at him and said, "Wow, this is the guy. This is the one that was promised in the Old Testament." You know. No, he just was a normal guy. Maybe you could even say a little more on the unattractive, you know, uh, uh, scale. And so why is that important? Well, because I believe what he just said, who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For, right? Why didn't they believe in him? Because when they looked at him, he didn't look like somebody who was going to be the Messiah. He didn't look like somebody that was going to be this great king. You remember when God's people, uh, when Samuel 
uh, was talking to the children of, of, of Israel, and they're like, hey, we want a king like the other nations. And they're like, no, 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 you don't. You just want to follow the Lord. You don't need a king. They're like, no, we want a king. Well, who's the king that they end up getting? Saul. Saul was this handsome guy. He was head and shoulders above everybody else. He's tall. He's huge. He's muscular, probably. And, uh, you know, think about uh, just the war and everything that he did. And, and, uh, and they looked at him as this great king. Then Jesus comes on the scene. He's supposed to be the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And he comes on the scene and they're like, this guy? You know, you can understand why a lot of people were just like, no, he's not the one. Because they, you know, they, they didn't understand why he was coming the first time and what he was trying to do. He kept trying to tell them why. Now, obviously, well, let me uh, not get, get ahead of myself. Okay, so uh, let me see here. C says, no form or comeliness, and there is no beauty that we should desire him. Now, his coming was prophesied again, over and over as this, this king that's coming and his kingdom's going to be set up and he's like this great leader. Uh, we're not going to turn to those verses, but you can read those references there. Genesis, Isaiah 9, uh, Daniel 7, where it's talking about this guy that's going to come and his kingdom's going to endure forever and, and all those things which are true. And we understand now, it, hindsight is 2020, right? We, we can look back and see what we understand. But his own disciples, when he came, didn't even understand that he was going to die. And then, uh, and then later on, you know, in a future time, come back and establish his kingdom. They didn't understand why he wasn't setting up his kingdom right now. But they still followed him through by faith. His disciples did. Okay, but, uh, but obviously, uh, you know, not everybody understood that. They were looking for this king. When Christ was born, look at Matthew chapter 2. Remember that the wise men came. There's your next two blanks there. The wise men. There's two words in the Bible. Matthew chapter 2. Remember what the wise men said. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that was born king of the Jews? For we have seen a star in the east and are come to worship him. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes and the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him, of course, they went back to, um, to Malachi 6, and, uh, and they, they came up with what he was saying here, In Bethlehem of, of uh, Judea, Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, Art not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor and shall rule my people Israel. And of course, this gets Herod scared and he tries to do something to stop uh, baby Jesus from growing and uh, tries to have all the uh, kids, all the males uh, killed from up, up to two years old. And you remember how that story goes. Why? Because he was afraid. This is, people are going to believe, he didn't necessarily believe in him. He just said, hey, people are going to believe that this is the king of kings and he's going to establish his kingdom and all that. We need to put it into this guy. And so, uh, so there was this understanding. These wise men traveled from far. They said, hey, you know, so I don't know if they had a vision, if the angels talked to them or what, but they, they, they see the star and they follow the star and they say, hey, where is the king? They brought him gold, frankincense, myrrh. They were like, hey, this is going to be, you know, this is going to be a, a big, important, you know, historic uh, event, which it was. But, you know, what we don't find in the Bible is what happened for the next 30 years. Right here you have these kings came, uh, you know, shepherds came. They all said, hey, this is the one. This is the king of the Jews. I really don't know what happened to the shepherds. How many of those shepherds continued to follow him? Maybe some of them did. You know, we see him as 12 years old and he's, and he's, people are marveling at his questions in the synagogue, but they don't necessarily seem to think, you know, be putting him up on a pedestal and saying, this is going to be our Messiah. Uh, they just, you know, he's just a regular guy. And we see how his neighbors don't think he's, uh, he's the Messiah. His own brothers don't believe he's the Messiah. And so like whatever happened from this original time where the prophecies are being fulfilled and here is the the, the child who's going to raise be the king of kings. And 
all of a sudden it seems like people don't believe that anymore. And it's probably because they looked at him and said, Psh, that can't be him. I mean, not only does he not look the part, but he also, you know, here he's born in a, in a manger. You know, he's refused from being able to stay in the inn. Uh, he's, he doesn't have, uh, you know, I'm getting into our next point here, so let me just go, go ahead. Number two is this, his affliction. Number one was his appearance. Number two is his affliction. So let's read uh, back to Isaiah 53. Let's read verse 3. He is, he, okay, so we talked about his appearance. No beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And he hid not, at, uh, and we hid not, at, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Okay, so here's this man of sorrows and a man acquainted with grief. He's a human. And he, 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 he cries and he, and he, you know, he, he's, uh, he has to eat, you know, and he sometimes doesn't eat and he has pain. Like, I don't know. The Bible doesn't show us in his, in this first 30 years. We don't see a lot about his life. We don't know what it was like for him to grow up as a child and all that stuff. But people are looking at him and saying, this is just a regular person. And he's not even that attractive and he's not even that muscular and strong and powerful. And he grows up and he's not even wealthy, apparently. And so, uh, you know, they're like, this is a man of sorrows and he's acquainted with grief. This, this can't be the Messiah. Apparently, he was born to a family with little wealth. Now, let me explain these verses here. You can look them up on your own sometime. But, uh, but when he was born, okay, we see that about the manger. Well, it seems like they, if they had a lot of wealth, they probably could have got a place to stay. You know, that's one thought. Uh, in chapter two, Luke chapter two, verse twenty-one through twenty-four, we see that after eight days, you know, they went to the temple to give an offering, which was the custom of the day. And the and it says in that passage that they brought uh, turtle doves and pigeons. And if you look under the Old Testament law, that was an offering that people could bring if they were poor right? Because they couldn't afford the, the more expensive animals, but they could bring turtle doves or they could bring a pigeon. And uh, actually, I don't remember if it says pigeon, but I remember the turtle doves. Uh, but obviously, this is what they were bringing. This was their offering of, of, a poor, of a poor family. Okay, so people would have looked at that and said, what is he, what is he doing? Now, this is kind of an interesting thought. I didn't really think about this, but you know, here he is actually the son of David, right? By by lineage and by promise of, hey, this king that's going to come, this Messiah is going to be of the lineage of David. That was something that they should have understood. And if you think about it, remember when David was picked to be king? They were like, surely you have somebody else here. You know, Samuel was like, I already went through all of Jesse's sons. And, you know, they're like, well, there's one other kid. Well, there's one other son, but you don't want him. David, that shepherd boy there, the little, little kid. You know, but then God ends up choosing him. And so, you know, really that shouldn't have been a huge surprise to the people that that the Messiah would come in that in that fashion. And again, he obviously Jesus wasn't a wimp. I'm not saying that, but his appearance and the way he lived his life and and the fact that he had a affliction and grief and, and and all that, it just didn't seem like the king that they were wanting. And so they rejected him. It says in Luke chapter 9 that he didn't even have a place to lay his head. Look at Luke chapter 9, verse 57. There's a, I knew there would be a whole lot of verses, which is why I'm skipping some, but you can, uh, you can look those up if you want. Luke chapter 9. And what did I say? Verse... Uh, um, I lost my place here. 57. Luke 9, 57. And it came to pass that as they went in the way, a certain man said unto him, Lord, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. And Jesus said unto him, Foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath nowhere to lay his head. And so it seems to me like these guys are following him, thinking like, this is where the king of kings is going to sleep. 
this is what we're going to eat? Like, where's all the, you know, where's the money? Where's all the food? Where's all the, you know, the expenses and, and the uh, fanfare that, that comes with the, with the king of kings? And so people kept him at a distance. And even his own disciples kept asking questions and trying to figure out what he was doing. Now, there is, there, there was hope that was provided to those who trusted in him, those who followed him. There was hope that was provided and it was in the miracles. Okay, that's your blank in, under B. There was hope. Uh, the only hope was his miracles. <clears throat> but some looked at him and the miracles that he did, and they saw him as no more than just a prophet. Okay, you're in Luke 9. Look at verse 18. Back to verse 18, he says, they, uh, you know, actually go to, yeah, 18. And it came to pass, as he was alone praying, his disciples were with him, and he, and he asked them, saying, Whom say the people that I am? They answered, and, uh, they answering said, John the Baptist, but some say Elias, and others say that uh, one of the old prophets have, ha, is risen again. He said unto them, But whom say ye that I am? Peter answering said, The Christ of God. And he straightway charged them and commanded them to tell no man this thing. Now, Jesus didn't even really want to be recognized, at, you know, at that point, like, hey, we need this king of kings. We need the, this ruler. Let's all follow him and let's give him all of our wealth and, and set him up to be our king. So how do we know that? Look at John 6. In fact, his actions had given enough hope to some people just through the miracles that he did that they wanted to force him into the position of a king. John chapter 6, verse 15. When Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force to make him a king, he departed again into the mountain himself alone. So, so he avoids having all these people. Now think about it. I could see where some people were like, oh, wait a minute. He didn't come with all this wealth. He didn't come with all this strength. But did you see him just turn five loaves and two fishes into food for everybody? So that's what he's going to do. He's going to provide for us. We don't have to worry. He's going to provide, take care of all of our needs. You know, we don't need money. We don't need uh, food. He's going to provide for that. If we get sick, he's going to heal us. And so they were seeing this, this guy who was producing these miracles, and they're like, hey, we want him as our king. But again, they're only thinking of setting up a kingdom on earth and the physical king. And, uh, and, and, and they weren't thinking about spiritual. They weren't thinking about, you know, uh, trying to actually listen to what Jesus was trying to say in his preaching. They wanted to make him a physical king. Though he continually wanted them, uh, warned him that he must suffer. Remember, over and over, he's even telling his disciples he was uh, going to have to suffer many things. The crucifixion seemed to be the last straw in driving away the small amount of followers uh, uh, who had remained. If you get to um, you know, the end of the story, go to Matthew chapter 26... And actually, we, I won't go to Zechariah, but uh, Zechariah actually prophesies what we see in Matthew 26, as you'll see here in a minute. Oops, going the wrong way. Matthew 26, look at verse 31. Then said, saith Jesus unto them, All ye shall be offended because of me this night. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. So we know that after Jesus, you know, after they say crucify him, crucify him, and they take him to put him on the cross, you know, we know Peter denies him thrice, and we know all the disciples just scattered. So well, why did they scatter? Why weren't they there? Now, John is later on at the cross, uh, but for the most part, where is everybody? Well, it said right here, they're going to be offended that night of him. They don't want to be linked with him. They don't want to, you know, have that risk of them being crucified or something like that. And so they all scatter. And uh, surely they're thinking in their mind, like, what is he doing? Why did he go to the cross? I mean, why did he just die? And they don't understand it. Even until Jesus res uh, resurrects from the dead, they, they still are perplexed. Okay, so we see uh, his appearance in verse 2. We see his affliction in verse 3. Now we're going to go back to Isaiah 53 and see his affection. Okay, 
this is the why he suffered many things, why he came uh, in the way that he did. The Bible says uh, that he was born, he, he had borne our griefs and sorrows. Look at verse 4. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. Notice it says that he was smitten. Here's your next blank. He was smitten and afflicted of God for us. That means, you know, God wanted him to be beaten. God wanted him to have his beard plucked out. God wanted him, you know, now, and I say God wanted him to, uh, I don't have time to preach this whole message. I've just recently spent a long time uh, in, in Iola on this, but uh, when Jesus was when Jesus was on the cross, he was he was in a manner of speaking still with God in heaven, because uh, he, he is God. You see what I'm saying? He was he is uh, he is part of the God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. He is part. These three are one. So he's 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 in heaven. And you say, well, you have any evidence of that? Well, I would say the thief on the cross, when he told him, hey, this day you'll be with me in paradise, when we know that he went down to the heart of the earth, right, I think that's pretty good evidence that he kind of existed at two places at one time. Because here he is as God being eternal and being everywhere present and having all the, the attributes of, of God because he is God. And then here he is as a man on earth, you know, uh, being limited in, in where he is. Uh, or whatever. How did I get off on that? Because I was saying, uh, uh, so here he is on the cross, you know, suffering for us. But this uh, this was the the desire of God, you know. Uh, God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Uh, this was His His idea that He would be beaten, He would be hung on the cross, He would suffer many things. It says He was wounded for our transgressions. Verse five. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. So he did all this for us. He bore our griefs and sorrows. He was smitten and afflicted of God for us. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. I mean, this is why he came so humbly. This is why he was, you know, when you think of him in that light, hey, everybody rejected him because he looked, you know, he didn't look the part. He didn't look, you know, attractive and powerful and all that. And so it was easy for people to, re to reject him. Look at uh, Philippians chapter 2. It explains this well. Philippians chapter 2. And go to verse 6. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, right? because he was God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in the fashion as a man, in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross whereby God hath, high, hath uh, highly exalted him and given him a name above, uh, which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow of things in heaven and things in the earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Okay, so we see that he will return one day, we understand, as the King of kings and Lord of lords, but he came the first time as a lowly and humble servant. He suffered willingly. And he was, even in his suffering, he was quiet and he resisted not. Go back to, uh, to the text again. Isaiah 53, verse uh, 7. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before his shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. And this is why the one thief on the cross, you know, there was a thief on his right and a thief on his left. And this is why one of them was like, hey, if you're the son of God, why don't you come down off of this cross and take us with you? <laughs> you know, but he was he went willingly. He didn't go and put up a fight. You know, he went uh, without even uh, opening his mouth. He was taken from 
prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Now this is packed with a whole bunch of stuff that real quickly I'll just point out a few things. It says that he was taken from prison uh, and from judgment. Okay, you can follow that in the gospel accounts. Um, it says, who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. I, I think what you can read there is just, you know, he, he died on the cross. So, hey, he didn't have any, you know, he didn't ever have a wife and children. Uh, I don't think he ever would have, but I'm just saying he didn't have a wife and children. So there's no, like, no, uh, you know, children that he left behind. There's no future generations. It says, who shall declare his generation? He was cut off from the land of the living, it says. And uh, for the transgression of my people was he stricken. Okay, okay he, he, obviously he did that for us. And he, was, and he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Now, that's interesting. It could be maybe a reference to the fact that, you know, because he was in a borrowed tomb because he wasn't going to need it for very long, just a few days, right? He was in a borrowed tomb, but the man who rented that, that area and put Jesus' body in there, uh, uh, not rented the area, but the man who, who provided that, that, uh, that lot, if you will, for him to be buried in was a rich man, the Bible says. Okay, so, uh, you know, who knows who, who he was buried with, but he was buried with other people that did, rich people, uh, wicked people, uh, which, according to James, often is the same pe it's people, wicked and rich, <laughs> okay? <laughs> Not all rich people are wicked, but uh, that could go together. Be okay, so, uh, because he had done no violence, neither was there any deceit in him, all right? So, so far, here's what we got. Now, you don't have to do this if you don't want to, but if you mark in your Bible, and especially if you're trying to memorize this first, here's something that might help you. I've got actually in my Bible written off to the side, verse 1, unbelief. Okay, this is kind of the introduction to the chapter. Verses 2 through 3 are his affliction. Verses 4 through, even though I broke it up a little bit differently, 4 all the way down to 9 is his affection. And now we're going to go into the last portion, which is verse 10 through 12, his ascension. Okay, now this is the one I had to stretch a little bit because of probably a better a better word to use would probably be his resurrection or, or something like that, but it fits. Okay, so just go with it, his ascension. Let's read it, verse 10. This might be a little bit hard to recognize at first, but I'll show you here in a minute. Verse 10 through 12. Yet it pleased the Lord to, to bruise him. He hath put him to grief when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. He shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hands. He shall see the prevail of his soul and shall be satisfied by his knowledge shall my righteous servants uh, just, justify many for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death. He was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Now, <clears throat> we understand from this passage he, why he came. You know, he was making intercession. We understand he was doing it for us. He was paying our price. And it says there in verse 10 that it pleased the Lord, this was part of the plan for, for His Son to go to the cross and be bruised and go through all these things. And then it says this, it shall make His soul an offering for sin. Now that's, that's pretty interesting because in the Bible a lot of times it'll call a person a soul, right? Because they're a living, breathing soul. They've got uh, not just a body, but they've got life in them as well. Okay, and so we think of a of a human being as having a both body and soul. Okay, and then you could add to that spirit or mind or or whatever you depending on the context. But a body, a, a person is a body and a soul. Okay, well we understand that when he died, his body was buried. Okay, in the tomb, but the Bible talks about his soul going somewhere as well. 
And he says in the Psalms, the prophecy that David said, my, my soul was not left in hell. I didn't write that down. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what verse it is, but he said, my soul was not left in hell. And it's David speaking, but it's prophetic about Jesus. Okay, and so we know that part of that offering for our sin was that Jesus, uh, his soul, something happened to his soul. Now, people get bent out of shape about this, and I, I kind of understand uh, but some will say, well, that's the biggest heresy you could ever say, that Jesus went to hell. Well, the Bible says that his soul went to hell. Now, some people, oh, well, that's not what hell means. Hell means, and I remember talking to somebody, I, I uh, uh, was showing somebody the gospel presentation in Swahili, because we had used that to lead some people to the Lord who spoke Swahili. And I'm like, well, I'm just assuming, I don't know, I can't speak Swahili, so I'm just assuming that we're giving them the right gospel. So I asked if any of my friends on uh Facebook, because I know some people that are missionaries to uh, Kenya or something like that. And I asked if anybody would listen to that and uh, and kind of tell me if you know if they agree with everything that's been been preached. And this guy who was actually a, a, a teacher at Heartland, he was a professor there, and uh, and he said, "Well, I know Swahili really well. I'll listen to it." And he re- and he wrote back to me and he said, "Hey, I agree with everything that he said." He said the only part that I thought was a little strange was he said that his his soul went to hell. And I was like, well, isn't that what the Bible says? He says, well, yeah, but the real word is that his soul went to Hades. And I'm like, but in the King James Bible, it says his soul went to hell, right? And he says, yeah. And I was like, so why in Swahili couldn't it be the same word for, for hell? And he's like, well, I mean, because he didn't really go to, to hell. And I'm thinking, whoa, whoa, whoa. You just, inter- you just put your interpretation into the Bible. You see what I'm saying? Because you don't want to accept that he went to hell, his soul went to hell. And so you said, well, that hell means something else. And then you put that into another version of the Bible. Say, so this is the this is where it gets kind of confusing when when translating other uh, other into other languages. But here's my thinking about this, okay? I believe that he his soul literally went to hell, right? What did it do? What did he do there? What was the, you know, <laughs> what was the significance of it or whatever? Hey, I could preach a whole sermon about that and we could uh, have debates about that or whatever. Uh, but I see right here in this verse in Isaiah 53 that that was part of the offering. You know, his soul went to hell. Now, he didn't leave his soul in hell. Neither did his body that was in the grave suffer corruption, the Bible says. Uh, so he, he did raise up both soul and body and ascended up into heaven. Uh, but it says here in, uh, oh, let's see. Do I have down first Peter for you? Cause I wrote it in my hand on mine, but first Peter chapter one, verse 18. First Peter one, 18. Uh, for as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition of your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blem- blemish and without spot, who verily was ordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who by him do believe in God, that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory that your faith and hope might be in God. So we see that it pleased God because it was his plan from the foundation of the world. Because it, it sounds pretty bad. You tell some people, oh, yeah, you know, God, this was his, and especially if, you're th- if, if, you have, if you really struggle with the idea of the Trinity, you're thinking like, why would God the Father, you know, just desire to have his son just suffer, <laughs> you know. Well, you don't understand that this was the plan from the very beginning that God would give of himself. He had sacrificed uh, his son and uh, his son would uh, take on human flesh and, and all that. Uh, this was part of the plan and it pleased God. Okay, his soul was made an offering for sin. Uh, but had he not resurrected, the whole plan would not have been complete, if you think about that. Now, so this will puzzle some people. Back to the, his soul was not left in hell. Some people say, yeah, but on the cross, he said, it is finished. So he didn't have to go to hell. He didn't have, to, well, wait a minute. Don't you also believe that he had to resurrect from the dead? 
So when he said, it is finished, that didn't mean that there was nothing else that was going to happen, right? He just said, hey, it's finished. My life, uh, you know, on earth and what I came here for, my mission is complete. And, his, and it was. And the body, he fulfilled, he fulfilled everything uh, that he was supposed to fulfill on this life up to that point, okay? And then his soul goes to hell for three, ni- three days, three nights, and it's not le- left in hell. Uh, uh, but here's the thing. If that was the end of it and he didn't resurrect, we would have a big problem because we also see prophesied from the foundations of the world that God was going to raise up from his people the Messiah. And his, his promise to David, King David, or what it's called here is the Davidic covenant. I, don't, I, I meant to underline that, but I don't think it is underlined in your thing. But the Davidic covenant, okay, look at 2 Samuel chapter 7. This prophesied that the seed of, of David, now this was prophetic, talking about Jesus, okay, because Jesus came from the line of, of David. But it said that the seed of David uh, would uh, set up, would be set up and that his kingdom would be established forever. So 2 Samuel chapter 7, almost done here. Second Samuel 7, verse 12. And when thy days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. All right, now some, you could say, well, yeah, okay, well, there was Solomon, and then what? Jeroboam, Rehoboam? I mean, things got pretty bad after that, okay? But Jesus did come from that lineage, and the Bible says that, hey, from his seed, uh, you know, the kingdom will be established forever. Now, look, go to Israel right now. They have no king. You know, um, go uh, and, and look through history. You'll say, like, what, what happened? This covenant just, well, did his covenant fail? Well, no, his covenant didn't fail because Jesus did rise up. And he has his kingdom established already right now, theoretically, but it's a spiritual kingdom. And one day he will come back and set it up physically, and that'll fulfill a lot of these pro- you know, what's already been prophesied. That'll you know we'll see those things come to pass. <laughs> but had he not re- uh, resurrected, you know that would have really messed up uh, what we already know was going to happen. And so, uh, so again, it, but it was all part of God's plan from the beginning. So <laughs> the Davidic covenant prophesied that his seed would be set up and his kingdom would be established forever. And though the kingdom won't be set up physically until the millennium, it continues in Christ as he sits upon his throne in heaven. Okay, so one more time, let's go back to uh, Isaiah. And let me read that again so that you're not too confused here. It says, uh, the second part of, of verse 10, He shall see his seed... He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hands. Okay, it keeps going. Verse twelve begins to describe where he's got. You know, he's now got the uh, the glory. He receives the glory and the honor and all that, and he's going to uh, uh, divide the spoil with the strong uh, because he poured out his soul unto death. He was numbered the transgressor. Okay, so it, it seems like. We know that at the name of Jesus, every knee is going to bow, tongue is going to confess. We understand that he's going to be given the glory physically one day. And, uh, and, and we see right there he's going to set up his kingdom, divide the spoil with the strong, all that. But he's going to see that seed, okay? So he has already fulfilled this. Uh, but anyway, this is just a, an amazing chapter in the Bible and one that is good. I'm glad that we're attempting to commit this to memory. <laughs> right? So uh, if you get the opportunity to do that, a lot of the verses you already know because they're quoted again, you, you know, somewhat know at least because they're quoted in many places in the Bible. You've maybe heard a few songs. Uh, he was wounded for our transgressions. <laughs> I mean, there's different things in here that you probably already know. Uh, hopefully you can break it down in your mind and maybe this will help you a little bit. But uh, we've got the fact that you know, unbelief, people aren't going to believe in him. Uh, we've got the talk about his appearance, 
right? This is just like what we'd see in any gospel. This kind of like sounds like a miniature version of John's, John's uh, gospel. We see his affliction. We see his affection, verse 4 through uh, 9. We see his ascension, verse 10 through 12. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, again, thank you for your word, and I thank you for this uh, scripture here. I pray that you'll help us to uh, commit it to, to memory if possible. If not, Lord, that we would just read it, consider, on, consider it from time to time, and to just to marvel at the goodness and the perfection of your word. And I pray, Lord, that you'll strengthen our faith, help us grow in uh, understanding of your word and in doctrine and, and uh, things hard to, to be understood. Uh, Lord, definitely keep us growing and keep us humble enough to correct uh, any false beliefs we might have. And I certainly know I don't have everything figured out, so I'm learning and growing all the time. I pray that that would be the case for all of us. We'd learn and grow together. I pray that you'll bless the rest of this night. Keep everybody safe as they travel back home. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.